Today on What's Going With Shipping, it's time for What the Ship, Top 5 Maritime Stories. I'm your host, Adam Cagliano. So we're going to look at the four big sectors in maritime shipping today. We're going to look at LNG, we're going to look at oil, we're going to look at containers, and we're going to look at bulk sector. And then we'll have one more story that I found really interesting this week. So a lot of news to get to. We're going to jump right into it. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into story number one. So story number one deals with containers. So containers have been a forefront of what the ship. We're going to keep looking at them all the time. What's interesting is the type of stories that are coming out right now. So this is a story uh, Mike Schuller did over at G-Captain. Maersk warns of dark clouds on the horizon for container shipping. We saw this. Soren Skew, the CEO for Maersk, made a series of appearances, including one on CNN, where they're talking about it. But what's really interesting here is the number of stories about Maersk that take different views based on what Maersk has been saying. So obviously what Mike is writing about here is the view that the amount of shipping that's going to be going across the world's oceans may be declining. However, when you start looking at some of these stories, it's not exactly what's happening. So this story right here by Lodestar, Maersk gives overstocked retailers the option to slow arrival. So how is Maersk dealing with this? And one of the things that we're seeing happen here is Maersk, along with all the other big container companies, are doing several things. And one of them right off the bat here is slowing down their vessels, what is known as slow steaming. Now, slow steaming was a feature of container cargo prior to covid because of the overcapacity in vessels prior to 2020, the ocean carriers had slowed down their vessels. In other words, they were conserving fuel, making the voyage cheaper. It was one of the ways they were lowering price. The other option that they're doing here is going to be what's called blank sailing and laying up ships, basically canceling voyages. And we see this story right here. Also from Lodestar, the idle box ship fleet sails past 1 million TEUs as blankings fail to stop the freight rate erosion. So as we know, the freight rate did a whole video on container rates and container volume falling. You can check out those two videos right above. But th this issue here is really important because one of the things we're seeing here is freight rates are falling precipitously on the West Coast from Asia to the U.S. West Coast. And we've gone in detail talking about this. But suffice it to say, to summarize it here, the reason we're seeing this precipitous fall in freight rates below COVID level rates we're talking about, we're down from $10,000 a box, which was extremely high, we're down below $1,500 a box. And the reason we're seeing that is twofold. Number one, the dysfunction and issues in the Southern California ports of LA particularly. And that has to do with a variety of things. Number one, the ILWU, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, along with the Pacific Maritime Association does not have a new uh, labor agreement in place. The old one expired on June 30th. They're working on that. We just saw an issue in the port of Oakland by a faction of the ILWU that created a potential moment of hesitation there with a strike. It went away very quickly. However, that uncertainty causes a lot of problems. Add to it AB5 and California emissions laws. We're going to see a big change in trucks that can go into the terminal starting on January 1st. AB5, which deals with truck drivers, the issue of independent truck drivers and contract truck drivers. Add to this also on top of it, the class one railways, which you need because most of the cargo that goes into LA and Long Beach travel by rail out of LA and Long Beach to the rest of the United States. All these factors have pushed cargo going not west, uh, not eastward across the Pacific, but westward, heading through the Suez to Europe and then across the Atlantic. But container co companies are trying to get a handle on this and in particularly get the rates back up on the Pacific route. So you're slowing the vessels coming down, you're limiting the number of vessels coming down, and you're starting to lay up the number of vessels coming down, which would tell you right off the bat, wow, it must be terrible to be a container uh, company. Except for one small problem here. This Greg Miller story over an American shipper. End of an era, profits finally peak for shipping giant Maersk. Record, record-breaking Q3, but market has deteriorated since August. Over here at G-Captain, ONE's profit surges despite sudden decline in demand. How is it? Freight, freight rates are down. Volume is down. Yet, 
profitability of companies like ONE and Maersk, two of the biggest ocean carriers there are, are up. And very simple. When we were at the peak of the market, at the peak, when, when we were talking about spot rates, not, not contracted rates, but spot rates were $25,000 for boxes, carriers offered long-term rates to lock in because there was a lot of uncertainty that the rates were going to stay high for a long time. And so a lot of the cargo that's going across now are at much higher freight rates than you're seeing right now for spot rates. And so the companies now are shoveling in money based on those higher rates. Yeah, you on a spot rate, you can grab a, a spot on a ship for about $1,500 across the Pacific. However, if you booked your cargo earlier, you may be paying three to $5,000 for those boxes. And that's where we're seeing those Q3 profits coming in. Now, Q4 and the first part of 2023 will be different, obviously. But for right now, the container companies are really shoveling it in. But this is also having unintended consequences elsewhere. Where? Well, for example, Port of Houston. Port of Houston to implement fees for long-dwelling containers. Okay, everyone who's ever watched my show earlier knows the absolute hatred I have for the hyper-demerge that Los Angeles and Long Beach threatened back in October of last year to get containers off their terminal. They, they came up with this harebrained idea that they were going to charge containers over a set period of time $100 a day increasing by $100 a day every day. So on day one, you pay $100. Day two, you don't pay $200. You pay $300 because now the fine is $200. The third day, the fine is an additional $300. So this is a crazy... First of all, I, I think it was illegal because I think LA and Long Beach brokered the same deal. So that that is working together. Second, I don't think that the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, would not call that excessive demerge. Now, on the other hand, ports like New York, Houston, Savannah, which have been the beneficiary of these new cargo coming in. We see right now New York is the largest port in the United States in terms of containers. It's eclipsed L.A. Now, remember, L.A. and Long Beach combined are still bigger, but New York on its independent is bigger. But New York has implemented a very interesting fine for long dwelling containers that takes a lot of factors into effect. And Houston here is doing the same thing. And so this is a much smarter way to implement these issues for cleaning containers, getting them out of the ports in a better. LA has always had a problem because they advertise forever that you can have containers sit on their terminal and they were fine with it. Which brings us to the last element in containerized stories this week. And again, another G Captain story from Mike Schiller. This year's holiday spending likely to set new records. So wait a minute. We're having this issue with containers. We're, we're talking about this whole issue across the board and issues with freight rates going down, container volume going down, even though container volume hasn't quite gone down yet, but it's going to go down. We know it based on containers coming out of Asia. But right now we're seeing years holiday spending likely to set new records. Why? Easy. Last year, when we were at the peak of this, a year ago, I mean, we're talking uh, last October, November, when we had 100 some ships off LA and Long Beach, a lot of cargo got landed that never got into stores prior to the holiday. And so stuff has been sitting in warehouses and retailers are dumping goods out in the marketplace, in their stores, in, in follow-up stores, you know, uh, kind, of, kind of wholesale stores to get rid of this volume of cargo and clean the warehouses out and get this open so that they could be moving cargo more efficiently. And so what you're seeing is ridiculous sales on goods. A lot of goods that were here last year that couldn't get the marketplace are now here. That's why you're seeing early sales across the board for, so for Halloween, we're seeing it for Christmas, seeing it across the board here. And so this is all playing out. The interesting aspect of this, I have to tell you, is going to be when this all resets at the end of the year. And we go into 2023 and we got new container ships coming online. We've got new fuel issues coming online that's going to force ships to slow down, shift fuels. And more importantly, how is the economy going? Because everyone is predicting recession for the United States early 2023. It's already hitting Europe. And the prediction is it's going to get hit hit here, especially with midterm elections looking like you're going to see the Republicans come in in both the Senate and the House. It's hard to see how this doesn't cause a lot of problems. All right, shift over to story number two. Story number two hits the oil market, and obviously a lot going on within the oil market we see happening. The big thing that's going to be 
on the horizon here is the G7 price cap on Russian oil that everybody is talking about looming on the horizon has the potential to lower the price of oil for Russia, which means that Russia will not be getting as much money in as it can. But more importantly, it would strategically impact Russia's ability to continue fighting the war in Ukraine. The real issue here is how does the G7 and all those other countries that are going to support this oil ban, we're talking about the bulk of the European Union. There's, there's two exception countries to, us, uh, to this. But how are they going to go ahead and do this? And it's basically through manipulation of insurance. So right here, this Reuters story over in G-Captain, Britain seeks shipping services ban for Russian oil. Confirmed over in the Splash 24-7 story, UK confirms it will not insure ships carrying Russian oil. Now, a good chunk of marine insurance, the 13 big uh, P&I clubs, these are protect protection and indemnity. These are the, the uh, insurers that insure the cargo. Large percentage of them are based in Europe. They're members of the G7. They're, they're in there. And so your UK is trying to do this by getting the insurers, the P&I clubs, to withdraw. The U.S. right now is seeing massive crude exports to Asia at record high. The sanctions that are, are looming in the horizon here for Russian oil is having an impact because we're seeing the amount of oil coming out of the United States at record numbers. This goes back to the issue I've talked about previously about why there is a quote unquote diesel shortage up in the mid Atlantic and the New England area. There's not a diesel shortage in that area. There's a problem in that energy traders are pulling that diesel out of that area and sending it over to Europe at a higher price, which then in turn makes your oil and diesel expensive. And then they scream Jones Act waiver because they blame it all on the Jones Act. Yet they are the ones who are perpetrating this. And it is a long, complicated story I've done in several other videos. But what we're seeing in the tanker sector right now is really a booming sector. This story right here uh, by Barry Parker, which is a great one. Again, I've talked about Barry Parker over at G-Captain, writes these great in-depth pieces. Strongly recommend you read this piece. Scorpio tankers score a home run as product tankers. These are tankers that carry diesel, gasoline, refined fuel. Hit it out of the park. And we're seeing right now a booming sector when it comes to product tankers. And same thing over with crude tankers. See dollar signs as Russia ban draws near. Euronav, TK tankers predict surge in, in war driven transport demand, largely because crude oil has to travel longer distances, ton miles over tons. All of this is looking great for tanker stocks, for tanker companies, for oil companies. This is looking great. Who it's not looking good for is two people. Number one, consumers. This is terrible for consumers because we're seeing surges in prices and inflation all the time. The other one it's not really good for is the environment. I go to this story over on Lloyd's List. Uh, Michelle Weiss-Bachman, fantastic writer for Lloyd's List. Everybody should. I, unfortunately, Lloyd's List is behind a paywall. Wrote this piece, and she has been following this story immensely. Great follow. Danger, uh, dark fleet danger is accident prone elderly tankers anchor off Malaysia. Here's that post on Twitter. I pulled it up. 43 tankers, average age, 20 years, engaged in deceptive shipping practices off Malaysia's southeast coast, amplifying marine casualty risks uh, near crucial oil trade artery. Two involved in casualties in the last six weeks, subsequently sanctioned by OFAC, an accident waiting to happen. There is a massive uh, anchorage off the coast of Singapore. And what you see here is that anchorage off there. And what they're doing is ship to ship transfers. We're seeing oil being shipped over to other tankers. And what they're trying to do is launder the cargo. Basically, this we've seen this done with Iranian and Venezuelan oil that are under some sanctions by countries. But now we're seeing it being done by the Russians. And this Russian crude is now being, you know, shifted over to other ships. And unless you're tracking and following it, it's really difficult. You may be purchasing oil that is Russian oil and you may not know about it, which exposes the person and companies buying it to potential criminal and fines because of the fact that it is sanctioned oil. So I want to read you part of a Twitter thread that uh, Samir Madani over at Tanker Tracker wrote 
because I think he summarizes the impact of this sanction quite a bit. With the removal of 29 direct export markets for Russia, the country will be left with a handful of volume importers who will each require deeper discounts in exchange for additional volume. This in itself is a win for the G7. Even if they cannot get the price cap in, the sanctions are going to force Russia to lower the price. In reality, the top remaining importers being China, India, and Turkey will be able to export refined products to the G7 nations while also making a massive profit margin in the process. Think about this for a second. Is those countries are going to buy cheap Russian oil, refine it, and then sell it back to the countries that are sanctioning Russia. And China, India, and Turkey are going to make the profit from it. This financial incentive will make the price cap very attractive and lucrative for the remaining importers. Even if they don't officially side with the G7 price cap, they're in effect enforcing it by buying at a massive discount. India and Turkey will ramp up more volume. China already imports up to 1 million barrels per day by pipeline in addition to maritime imports. So they're not likely to boost imports any further as they grow too dependent on Russia. That's true. One of the things we always see with China is their multiple sourcing under the Belt and Road Initiative. Samir goes on, nations such as Saudi Arabia and Iraq are already understanding that there will be less room for their oil in destinations such as India in particular, and are now looking at other destinations. The top remaining buyers for them will be the EU. Undoubtedly, oil market finds a way. And I think Sam really hits it out of the park on that one. Uh, I'll have a link to the whole thread here, and you can take a look at it. But I think when Sam talks, people should listen when it comes to the oil market. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at story number three. All right, story number three deals with the bulk market. And we've talked a lot about the bulk market. One of the biggest things we've been talking about recently is the drought going on in the United States that's impacting the Mississippi River, which is still going on, by the way. We're still having low water on the Mississippi River. Did a whole story on this in not just the Mississippi River, but we're seeing it down on the Piranha River, down in South America. We see it on the Rhine in Europe, and we see it in the Yangtze in China. And there's other rivers around the world. But you know, also at the same time, we have, need to understand that while some areas may be encountering drought, others may be expecting uh, unexpected rainfall. So in Pakistan, for example, we're seeing a huge amount of, of rain right now. But I tend to focus on where it impacts shipping. Uh, I'm, I'm not a weatherman. I'm not telling you where it's drought and, and rainy a lot. But in the bulk sector, we're really seeing it play out here quite a bit. So this story from Reuters, the Baltic Dry Index snaps 12-session losing streak. So the Baltic Dry Index measures worldwide, basically, the uh, rates on bulk carriers. And very much it's an index that we're using all the time to measure it. And you see right here, the overall index, which factors in rates for Cape Size, Panamax, and Super uh, max shipping vessels carrying dry bulk commodities rose 33 points, about 2.6%. And this is, again, measuring that. Now, remember, different size vessels do different trades. We've got grain, we've got ore, we've got all different commodities. And depending on the size of the vessel, Cape size go around the Cape of Good Hope, for example, all different areas. So <clears throat> obviously a great impact here for the, the market. However, there are factors at play here. Rain in Canada deals latest blow to global grain trade. So earlier this year, had a story about the closing of the bridges over the Fraser River in British Columbia. It's amazing that the Mississippi River Valley is experiencing massive droughts, yet just to the northwest, up in northern Canada, we're seeing massive rains. And right now, grains that's been harvested, sitting on trains, in silos, and grain elevators in the interior of Canada cannot get across Canada to Vancouver to be loaded on bulk carriers. The, the, the parking lot off Vancouver looks a lot like LA and Long Beach did, except in this case, it's bulk carriers. And understand, a lot of this grain gets out and feeds the world's economy and feeds the people. But it's not getting out now. Meanwhile, at the same time, not too far away, we're still seeing the drought on the Mississippi River and the impact it's having with some product makers, some soybean growers, wheat, deciding to just store their grain for next year and wait for the uh, system to clear up so they can ship down. They don't want to get their product caught in the system and enter a market too late and lose out on potential money. Same time, we're seeing stories like this from Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7. The dry bulk uh, braces for troubled end to the year. I, I mean, we're talking about the 
Baltic dry index being up. We're talking about bulkers being up. But at the same time, we're seeing these issues. And as this is not enough that we're seeing down in Brazil. There's a strike going on right now. Protests uh, against grain exports from Brazil's largest port is taking place. And then we had the issue recently with Russia basically pulling out of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. They're back in again. But again, we're seeing this. And again, there's some great analysis out there on the Black Sea Grain Initiative, but I think everybody's got to take a step back. And while you can look at the numbers coming out by the UN, that 10 million tons of grain coming out of Ukraine is fantastic. It's great. That's 10 million tons since August. In August last year, they shipped 6 million tons. So they're not getting all the grain out they need. Most importantly, they're not getting fertilizer sent in. Nothing can go into Ukraine. So when you would normally have fertilizer coming in so that you can basically fertilize the fields and prep them for next year, that's not being done. And so there's a lot of issues at play. Meanwhile, Russia's food and fuel and fertilizer is flowing right now. We're about to see sanctions on their fuel but the food and fertilizer are moving without a problem. And again, what we're seeing is the impact this is going to have on us. These disruptions in global food, the bulk trade, is going to resonate throughout the supply chain system. All right, let's go over and jump to story number four. Story number four, I want to talk about liquefied natural gas and the fact that it is making the news in the mainstream media. So I'm going to pull myself away from GCAP and Freight Waves, Splash 24-7, and Lloyd's, and go over to the Financial Times. LNG tankers idle off Europe's coast as traders wait for gas price rise. That's the issue they're saying. The other issue you have right now has to do with capacity ashore to take liquefied natural gas. Understand, you've got to get the liquefied natural gas off the tankers. You have to change it from its liquid form to a gas form. And you have to have the connections to do that and the storage tanks capable to hold it. In its liquid form, you can hold a lot more natural gas. This is the whole reason we liquefy it on ships. You, you refrigerate it down to 260 degrees below Fahrenheit. Uh, I think it's about 165 Celsius below uh, zero. You do that so that you can carry it in this state and carry a lot more of it. When you warm it back up to room temperature, it expands greatly. I mean, it's about 1,600 times the volume. And so you have to refrigerate it, or not refrigerate it, you have to supercool it to get it down to that level. The problem is capacity ashore is, is at its max. Pull this chart off about Europe's natural gas storage. So right here, the white line shows you 2022. So right now, uh, natural gas storage in Europe is basically right in the butter zone that we've seen over the past seven years. Uh, it's actually a little bit on the high side right now. However, what the concern is, is winter looming on the horizon is ensuring that there's enough supply on hand to be able to take it. Right now, the issue with these tankers off the coast is when you have ships like this off the coast, they burn off. You evaporate part of that cargo. You're losing a portion of that cargo every day the ship is at sea with the cargo on board. So you're going to start losing cargo. And more importantly, the question is, what happens when other nations around the world want LNG? This story over in oil price. U.S. LNG cannot replace the Russian natural gas that Europe has lost. Europe has re relied on U.S. LNGs to offset the loss of Russian gas with nearly 70% of U.S. LNG exports heading to Europe in September. In the long term, Europe will have to find other sources of natural gas as its inventories are likely to drain over the upcoming winter. Ultimately, Europe will have to reduce demand for natural gas going forward as there is little available supply left. The other issue that's, that's in the story there, but it wasn't in the highlights there, is that demand is going up in Japan, South Korea, and China. And the U.S. is going to be forced in a bidding war. And again, this is energy traders. Energy traders are going to take loads on cargo ships and send it to where it is the most profitable. If it's Europe, they'll send it to Europe. Why is it sitting off Europe right now? Because that's most profitability for them. They're also getting a half a million dollars a day, the ship charters, to have those cargos out there. But if all of a sudden demand spikes in China, Japan, and Korea for LNG, they're going to start heading there. 
And Europe may see that graph all of a sudden crash down at a much faster rate than expected. That's the big fear. Right now, supplies are good. They've got supplies. They've got ships standing by to offload. But if the supply crashes, it's going to be really hard to replenish European supplies in any manner that's quick because it takes several weeks to get ships across from the United States over there. Plus, you may have to reposition ships if a ship's in China or Asia offloading. It takes a while for it to sail back across, get to a loading facility in the United States, and then discharge in Europe. All right, let's go to our last story. All right, story number five, a story I saw across several uh, uh, sources, but I pulled this one off Splash 24-7. South Africa presses ahead with national shipping line plans. We've seen this with Australia, with several other countries around the world that are concerned that they're too overly dependent on foreign shipping firms, particularly the Big Ten container liners, for their shipping. And therefore, they want to ensure that they have a domestic national fleet that's available to them should they need it. This is something that the United States realized after World War I. We passed the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, what became the Jones Act. And the Jones Act ensured not only do we have a domestic fleet on our coastwise trade, but also in the international trade. And we're seeing that done more and more. And so I think there's a lot of realization that it's within a nation's good interests to have not 100% of its cargo shipped on its own ships, not even 50%, but a portion so that it is available as needed. And you have a little bit of a margin so that if one shipping company or something happens, you at least have control over a certain aspect of your shipping. You can exercise control over a certain aspect of your shipping and to be a player in the market. That goes with a story that I saw come out from this. Uh, Matson returns to Philly Shipyard for three more Jones Act container ships. I did a whole tweet thread on this for a variety of reasons. So back in 2018-2019, uh, Matson had two container ships built at the Philly Shipyard. And these ships were used in their West Coast to Hawaii trade, but they've also been used on their CLX run to China. Well, now they're doing three more. When they built the first two, they were about a quarter of a million, a quarter of a billion dollars each. It's about $250 million. Uh, now, the three they're going to build now are going to cost them about of a third of a billion. So you're talking about three ships for a billion dollars. And let me be clear. I knew beforehand that the Cato Institute heritage and everyone who opposes the Jones Act was going to go nuts about this. They literally had to have lost control of themselves. Uh, it was only a matter of time until I came out it. So I did a preemptive Twitter thread on this, already talking about this. And number one, let me be clear, Matson should have been smarter right off the bat. They should have negotiated with Philly options for ships. They should have sat there and said, listen, if we come in with options later, what's the cost going to be? Because they could have gotten five ships probably for a billion dollars. But let me go to the billion dollar issue because I think it's really important to do it. What you're going to hear is a couple of things. Number one, these ships are a lot smaller than bigger ships. And those bigger ships that are being built in China, Japan, and Korea, you know, these are going to be 3,600 TEU ships. Those are 20 foot equivalent units, containers. You know, they're building 20,000 TEU ships for half the cost for $150 million. Well, yeah, in China and Korea, you can get that done really easy. Why? Well, number one, economy of scale. They're building ships like crazy. So they're not building one-off vessels. But two, uh, the country subsidizes them heavily. China subsidizes their shipyards. They're state-owned shipyards. The Korean shipyards are partially state-owned now because they bailed them out. And they're providing a huge amount of incentives to the Korean shipyards. Japan gets away with it by buying ownership in their ships. If you built five ships like this in Japan, two of the ships would be either owned outright by Japan or Japan would own shares of all these vessels. And so they'll build you a cheaper vessel, but then they're getting money in the ownership. Should also mention the three new ships are gonna be LNG fueled, which means on the after portion of this vessel, you're gonna have to put LNG holding tanks. There's a lot of issues in this. You know, and, and let me be clear, whenever you build a container ship, the biggest cost you're paying for is the hull and the machinery. That's it. Whether you're building 3,600 TEUs or 20,000 TEUs, the engine and the hull is a big thing. Yes, bigger ship requires more hull, more steel, and a bigger engine, but you still need an engine. You still need a hull. That's the big sunk cost. And what should be happening right now is while 
Matson goes in with this. The United States just did a, C, a video on this on seal of recapitalization. The U.S. government should be sitting there saying, hey, those are useful looking ships. Maybe we should add on to that deal and order some for the U.S. government or better yet, order 10 or 20 of them for the U.S. government and we'll lease them out to private ship firms to use as necessary, akin to a project we did in the 1950s called the Mariner program. And matter of fact, one of the things you're seeing right now is a lot of talk about this. Senator Wicker came out and strongly condemned the unlawful and unnecessary Jones Act waiver for Puerto Rico that I talked about extensively in previous videos. So I think there's a lot of nations looking at their maritime policy and sitting there saying, man, we need to relook at this. We need to re-examine it and decide whether or not we need to be just completely dependent upon foreign shipping for all our needs. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, if you can, please contribute to the page. How can you do that? Easy. There's a super thanks button down below there. You can hit that and contribute to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see the link at the end of the video or in the show notes. Head on over there. You become a monthly yearly subscriber to the channel that allows me to get behind that Lloyd's list paywall, which is a little bit expensive. Trade wins is the really expensive one, but get behind those paywalls, put this news together, package it together. So you get the news on all the major sectors in the maritime industry until our next video. This is Al signing off.